Next on American History TV, author Donald Thomas analyzes the acoustic evidence in the Kennedy assassination and attempts to trace the timeline of events from that day in November 1963. He also discusses acoustic findings by the 1970s House Select Committee on Assassinations. Thomas's 40-minute presentation is entitled JFK Acoustical Evidence, Challenge and Corroboration. He spoke at a conference marking the 50th anniversary of the release of the Warren Report, hosted by the Assassination Archives and Research Center. Uh, in 1978, the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations heard uh, testimony from acoustical experts that the gunfire that killed President Kennedy had been recorded on Dallas police uh, radio and that it included a gunshot from the grassy knoll. Well, that evidence has been under challenge ever since it came out. Uh, most recently in a, in a book by a political scientist here in Virginia, Larry Sabato, uh, wrote a book called The Kennedy Legacy, and it included a chapter on the assassination, uh, for which he uh, commissioned a study of the acoustical evidence by a firm called Sonalist. And the Sonalist issued a report which said that the uh, acoustical evidence was invalid. Some of you might have been president in Pittsburgh when I spoke, and I just had to say that I hadn't actually read the study. It just came out, so I couldn't fairly comment on it. So today I am going to, uh, I've had a chance to read it, and so I will make some comments about it. Um, uh, for starters, nowhere in the Sonalist report is there a discussion, uh, let alone analysis, let alone criticism of the core acoustical evidence. And by core acoustical evidence, I mean there are sounds on the Dallas police tape which the acoustical experts identify as the gunfire that killed President Kennedy. Uh, well, since they didn't analyze those sounds, then how could they, how did they show that the acoustical evidence is invalid? Well, of course they didn't. Uh, so why did they say that the acoustical evidence is invalid? That's what I want to talk about. On the day President Kennedy was assassinated, the Dallas police were uh, broadcasting over two channels. One they called, which they designated as Channel One, was the primary channel for routine 24-7 broadcasts. It was being recorded on a, on a Dick Belt logger, oops, <laughs> like this one here. And they also had an auxiliary channel, which they designated Channel 2, which was used for special events. In this case, it was for communications among the president's security detail. It was being recorded on a gray autograph machine like the one shown here. So the president's security detail was divided into two components. He was scheduled to give a luncheon speech out at the, uh, the Dallas Trade Mart, uh, the Market Hall for which 400 police officers have been detailed to provide security, guard detail. The motorcade uh, had 18 motorcycles uh, along with a pilot car driven by the, uh, I'm sorry, driven by Secret Service, but had the chief of police giving directions on how to get to the trademark. So these two groups were in radio communication over Channel 2. So I'll start by, I'm going to go ahead and play the crucial part uh, from Channel 2 uh, which has live broadcast coming from Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination. I'm at the train mark now. He's back out that way. Okay, so obviously uh, the key broadcast coming from Chief Curry, uh, the first one to overtly indicate the assassination has happened is the one, the orders to go to the hospital. 
Uh, the other broadcast, which came from Dealey Plaza, from Chief Curry, was when he announced that he was at the triple underpass. So he's in Dealey Plaza. Uh, in between the two, you see the dispatcher said it was 1230. All right. This is uh, a picture from the motorcade shortly after, seconds after the shooting, in fact. Uh, there's the limousine in front of the picture there's the underpass is the bridge here back here and that's uh, the lead car the pilot car that's where those broadcasts were coming from from Chief Curry now seconds later uh, Chief Curry when he got underneath the underpass he stopped and the limousine pulled up alongside him and that's when he knew the president had been shot and that's when he made the broadcast to go to the hospital. To put that into a perspective, this is the this is Elm Street. This is the triple underpass. Uh, that's the grassy knoll. There's the book depository. So this is the kill zone. The president's limousine was in this area when he was uh, shot. This uh, so the lead car was about 150 feet in front of him. So that broadcast, when he says, I'm at the triple underpass, that's the broadcast that actually closes to the time of the shooting. So that's our marker for the time of the assassination on that channel. Meantime, uh, over on channel one, very unusual, but as it turns out, fortuitous event happened. Uh, for five and a half minutes, uh, the channel was dominated by the sound of a motorcycle motor and that occasioned the following broadcast. Okay, that was at 12.33. And the question is, what made the dispatcher, assassination's at 12.30, this is three minutes later, and so the question is, what made that dispatcher so certain that the motorcycle was on Stemmons Freeway? The clue is in this one minute earlier on Channel 1. Okay, <clears throat> you could hear sirens. The one, the dispatcher knew that the one emergency happening at the time was the president had been shot, the limousine was on its way to Parkland Hospital with its police escort, sirens blaring. So he simply made the deduction that the motorcycle must be with the motorcade. Well, if that motorcycle is with the motorcade, and there were one of the 18 with the motorcade, there was a chance then that it was in Dealey Plaza and had its microphone open, and if so, we would have captured the sounds of the gunfire and have direct evidence relevant to one of the great controversies of the assassination, that being the number of shots. Was there the three that the Warren Commission insisted on, or was the more than three as all the evidence seemed to indicate? So the House Select Committee arranged for an acoustical expert firm to analyze the recording. They chose, uh, on the recommendation of the Acoustical Society of America, a firm called uh, BBN, uh, most famous for doing the Watergate tapes, but more importantly, they had done the Kent State shooting tapes, which was the first forensic use of acoustics to identify the origin of a gunshot. And more recently, they developed the boomerang, uh, the anti-sniper device, which is on our military vehicles, which in real time tells from the gunshot exactly where the sniper is on uh, display, a screen, the GPS. Uh, so they were asked to apply this technology to the police tapes. First thing they did was analyze the dicta belt looking for sounds that could be gunfire, and they found five. So they went to Dealey Plaza. They fired test shots from the book depository and from the grassy knoll and compared those test shots and found that all five of them matched, uh, the sa suspect sounds matched to test shots fired in Dealey Plaza. So. Uh, including one that matched to the grassy knoll. So that was one welcome news for in some quarters. And so the House Select Committee decided they needed to get in a second opinion. So they went to uh, another laboratory. Uh, these fellows, Weiss and Ashkenazy, 
were experts on uh, signal analysis, especially sonar. So they had them uh, uh, review the study that was done by BBN, and not only did they concur with the analysis and the methods in their conclusions, they actually applied then their sonar analysis to the alleged uh, grassy knoll shot to show to a scientific certainty that there was a gunshot from the grassy knoll on the Dallas police tape. As I said, it's been an under challenge ever since. The first challenge came from the uh, Justice Department. Uh, uh, the House Select Committee said now that we have evidence for conspiracy, the Justice Department should reopen the case. And they, rather than do that, they asked for yet another review of the acoustical evidence. So they arranged for this fellow, Luis Alvarez, and others to uh, uh, do a study of the acoustical evidence. Uh, for over a year, they tried to find flaws in the analysis, the core acoustical evidence, were unable to, but then they found, uh, thanks to a phone call from a rock musician who would listen to the call, that there was a crosstalk, simulcast between the channels. Okay, and what that means is, remember, channel one, is the one that has the sounds that have been identified as gunfire. Channel 2 is the broadcast that's coming from Dealey Plaza where we can pinpoint the time of the assassination. So if these sounds are in fact the gunshots that killed Kennedy, they had to have been deposited on the recording at the very instant Kennedy was being shot. If there's some way to synchronize events between the two channels, then you can see if they are synchronous. Well, there was a simulcast. And ironically, it's this one. And uh, you want to go ahead and play for us? Hello? Okay, so the irony is that a broadcast from the lead car from Sheriff Decker uh, ordering his deputies to surround the grassy knoll and hold everything secure is supposed to be evidence that there was no gunshot from the grassy knoll. Well, the part that simulcast over, that was crossed over from channel one to channel two, were these three little words, hold everything secure. Now this broadcast comes about 80 seconds after uh, the broadcast that says, I'm at the triple under pass. So, and on the channel one recording, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, on the channel one recording, the sounds are almost exactly simultaneous with those words, hold everything secure. So here's the scenario. Is my thing working here? I guess I've run out of a uh, laser. <laughs> but you can see where the shooting is on channel two, and you can see where the shots are on channel one. And when you align the simulcast together, it shows that they are completely separate, they're disconnected, and therefore this was evidence to show that the acoustical evidence is therefore invalid. So this is their scenario, and this is the actual truth. This is the reality is that there was not one, but there were actually five simulcasts on the recording. And if you use any one as your anchor point or tie point, none of the others synchronize with themselves. And so the reason is because these are not continuous full-time recordings. The timeline is broken. And they had simply chosen the simulcast that was the most disconnected to try to show that the acoustical evidence was invalid. If you'll notice, however, that there is one broadcast which is the closest one to the actual time of the shooting. Oh, my laser's coming back. There, okay. The Fisher, a broadcast by Deputy Chief Fisher, if you see where it aligns to the shooting and where it aligns to the shots, and this is and this, of course, has a special significance because it, because it is the closest one to the actual time of the assassination. It's the one that's most reliable because it's the least likely to be disrupted by whatever's causing the breaks in the timelines. 
Okay. Also, there's a difference between false negatives and false positives. If you have a break in the timeline, that automatically creates a false positive. It will automatically make things that are really synchronous appear to be non-synchronous. But a break in the timeline cannot make something appear synchronous. That requires a diabolical coincidence. That's the difference between a false negative and a false positive. So in this case, you, to say that's a false positive requires a diabolical coincidence. Okay. So I'm going to play this for you now. This is the, uh, to remind you, this is that crosstalk. I'm at the trademark now. I'll head back out that way. Okay, so this is Deputy Chief Fisher who says the words, uh, now that's all right, I'll check it. And those three little words, that fragment of speech was simulcast over onto channel one. And you'll notice it's just two seconds before he says triple underpass, which is our marker for the time of the assassination. Now we go over and I'll play for you the, oh, wait, hold on, don't, not yet. <laughs> All right, what I'm going to explain is you're, what you're going to hear is you're going to hear those two simulcasts. You're going to hear him say, I'll check it, and then seven seconds later, 11 seconds later, you'll hear him say, hold everything secure. In between those two are the sounds that the acoustical experts identified as gunshots. Now, you're not going to hear the blamity blam blam because this is not a high fidelity recording. If you could hear the gunshots, if it was a high fidelity recording, you wouldn't need acoustical experts to come uh, tell you that these are gunshots. This is a, it's called a voice grade recording. The radio was voice grade, which means that it amplified sounds in the frequency of a human voice. That was to, to enhance uh, radio communications. Uh, it does not, it doesn't mean that the gunshots won't be there. They're just not amplified. So they're buried in the background. That's why you need the acoustical experts to go out and do their study. All right, so I'm going to play for you now. You can hear uh, the two simulcasts. Play it for you again, so now you know what you're listening for. You So far, yeah, far from being proof that the acoustical evidence was invalid, it actually, when you look at all the crosstalks, you find it does corroborate the timing of the gunshot sounds as being simultaneous with the assassination. Now, here comes Larry Sabato and his study by Sonalist. This is what he says. He says, our research demonstrates the police officer with the open microphone was traveling at a high rate of speed at the time the slow-moving presidential motorcade progressed through the streets of downtown Dallas. And uh, I had the WTF moment when I read this because, okay, we all know that the uh, motorcycle, uh, the motorcade had slowed to a crawl as it went through Dealey Plaza, so that part is right. Yeah, the motorcade is going really slow. In fact, that's one of the controversies. Why did the, who routed this through Dealey Plaza and all these turns where the president was a sitting duck? So, but he says that the motorcycle at that time is moving at a high rate of speed. But that's not what, we've, what we find at all. Okay, first of all, to put this into perspective, uh, when, the, when the acoustical experts analyzed this data, what they found was that the very first sound on the police recording matched to a test shot that was recorded on a microphone here, uh, which is on Houston Street. The second sound matched to a test shot uh, that was recorded on a microphone here at 
a little closer to the intersection, the third at this position, and the fourth here and the fifth here. Uh, it was this order in the data, not just the matching of the sounds to, um, between the test shots and the radio sounds that convinced them that these were the gunshots, this was the gunfire because of the way they were ordered. Uh, they were in one, two, three, four, five order. If this were random noises, if they were anything else other than it had nothing to do with the topology of Dealey Plaza, they would be in random scattered order. There wouldn't be any particular order. But they're in one, two, three, four, five. There's only there's one chance in 125 you can get those five to line up like that. But it's not just the sequence, it's the spacing because on the police tape, the first three sounds are about a second apart. They're spaced at about a second. And then there's a five second space, and then there's two sounds close together. So the spacing also matches the, the spacing on the recording. And furthermore, the trajectory matches because the distance between this microphone and this microphone is 130 feet. And the spacing on the radio is 8.3 seconds. Now to go 130 feet in 8.3 seconds, that's the speed of about 11 miles per hour. And the Dallas, the FBI studying the Zapruder film showed that the average speed of the motorcade was 11.3 miles per hour. So you've got a precise match. It was that order in the data that convinced the acoustical experts that this was the uh, assassination gunfire. And for us, what it means is that the motorcycle had to have been here at the intersection at the time of those first three shots. He had to be right in here. So when we go back and we look in the Zapruder film and the other films, uh, the newsreels, uh, what we find is that of the 18 motorcycles, it's easy to show that 17 of them were definitely in the wrong place. But one guy, this is Hollis McLean, H.B. McLean, we see him just before the fire, before the assassination, he was just turning onto Houston Street, and this picture taken about 30 seconds after the shooting, that's him on uh, Elm Street. So at a reasonable rate of speed, he could have been at that intersection. He's the one guy that could have been in the right place at the right time. And then, uh, so this models out the sequence of where he uh, would have been. So he's, he's driving slowly, I'm sorry, he's driving at a relatively steady rate and on Houston Street. If I'm pointing the right place, he slows to about 11 miles an hour through the intersection and then he idles along for about another 30 seconds. And that is uh, consistent what we see in various newsreels. Here's one that's good because it shows all four of the motorcycles that were in this uh, part of the motorcade. Plus Hargis. Uh, Hargis is the guy who was right behind Kennedy. He got off his motorcycle and he ran up onto the grassy knoll because that's where his shots came from. Then he decided he'd better stay with the motorcade, so he ran back to his motorcycle. This was taken about 20 seconds after the assassination. This was taken about 28 seconds after the assassination. And now this is McLean, the far side. It's Hargis's motorcycle. And then there's a police officer named Corson who's catching up to uh, McLean. And then when Corson caught up with McLean, they raced off. They, you can see they're leaning, they're speeding up. So this is about 30 seconds. Now, this is the evidence that Sonalist uses. Sonalist analyzed that recording. They, they analyzed the loudness of the motorcycle motor, and they said, okay, we're going to correlate. There's a correlation between the loudness of the motorcycle motor and the speed. Now, anybody who's actually had a motorcycle know that there's a, not a really good correlation, but nevertheless, it's reasonable to say that the motorcycle's humming along here, and then for about 40 seconds, if you look at the timeline down here from about 14 minutes to 15 minutes, there's about a 40-second trough here where the motorcycle motor has slowed down. And up here are their markers, because there, if you can see it, uh, is where he's got your two simulcasts where he says, I'll check it, and where he says, hold everything secure. And that corresponds right after that sound dropped. And that's what you hear on the radio. So why in the heck are they saying that the motorcycle is going fast at the time when the shots were happened, when the assassination happened? Well, it's back over here. They say this is where the assassination occurred, according to the NRC panel, on that bogus timing that they used from that crosstalk. 
So in reality, all of their evidence actually fits what we know of the, the films and the sounds on the recording. In fact, what they say, this is something new, they said that there's divergent data around 1430 right in here that suggests there's multiple motorcycles right in this time. Well, yeah, there's three motorcycles together right at that moment. So all of their sounds, all of their sosonalist analysis perfectly fits the acoustical evidence. The only thing that doesn't fit was that old NRC panel claim that, that was in not synchronous with the time of the assassination. So the sonalist report does not assess the core acoustical evidence. The sonalist data is actually consistent with and corroborates the acoustical evidence. And the sonalist report depended on that discredited timeline analysis to challenge the evidence. And I'll take any questions. Good, it was all perfectly clear. <laughs> Paul, you're always ready, aren't you? Yes, I know. Uh, Dr. Thomas, um, I am reading your book, Hear No Evil. Um, the best evidence seems to suggest that President Kennedy was hit by four separate bullets, two from the front and two from behind, and that Governor Connolly may have been hit by one or two additional bullets. And then, of course, we know there was a bullet that flew over the motorcade and hit the cement, and a cement fragment flew up and hit bystander James T. Take in the cheek. And then there's another photograph of a police officer picking up a bullet from the grass. Now, on Robin Grogan's um, DVD, A Case for the Conspiracy, you can hear five separate shots. Assuming that there are six or more shots, how do you account the fact that you can't hear them? Well, I guess I wouldn't assume that there were six or right. more shots. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the five shots. Okay. okay. Now, I have heard uh, people ask me that question all the time, actually. And uh, basically, the question being, what if somebody was shooting with a silencer? Yes. Okay. And, well, yeah, if there's somebody shooting with a silencer, then I'm not going to pick it up on You're, the police okay. radio. That, but, so it's, it would be a silencer. Okay. That, if you can't hear that, the shot. That would be in a scenario. Okay. I'm not. Right. Personally, I don't, I don't see why, if they're blasting away from three different places, why somebody with a silencer would be involved. But strictly on the acoustical evidence, yeah, you can't. You would have to be a silencer. Dr. Mantic? Always good to hear you, Don. Uh, tell me, did you do your analysis based on the Bowles tape, or have you used the FBI copy also? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that, because really the, um, the real acoustical evidence, the heavy lifting was done by these guys at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. I'm sort of in the position of defending, I claim I understand the evidence, and actually, as far as anything acoustical, really, it was where I, uh, I calculated the caliber of the, of the gun from the, uh, from the shock wave on there. Yeah. But yeah, we were, we were using the actual the FBI. Uh, in, what I played for you here was the FBI recording. Go ahead. So your original paper used bowls, but now you're using FBI? I'm still not quite sure. No, as far, okay, again, I didn't do the analysis. When, uh, when uh, Barger, when the BBN did their analysis, they did, they used the Bulls tape. Right. Right. The FBI tape was recorded, was made in 82. Right. Okay. Right. Dr. Thomas, uh, I'm Brian Rooney. Could you just explain briefly the significance of that bell ringing that you, that's, it was on your presentation? I don't think you mentioned it. Right. I know that's a controversial uh, right. thing for some people. Okay, yeah. And I think the, the bell probably does have a lot of good clues as to how it, uh, uh, how it got on there. It turns out uh, uh, the original, one of the original criticisms was that there was no bell 
but it was picked up audibly and there was no bell in Dealey Plaza. Uh, and then later, later it turned out, in fact, it was Gary Mack that went back and found recordings because it was one year later that uh, one of the news teams had gone to Dealey Plaza for the first anniversary and had recorded ceremony there in Dealey Plaza. And lo and behold, right at 1230, you could hear a bell. <laughs> so there was a bell in Dealey Plaza. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's where that bell came from. Because later it was discovered that there's a slight offset in town in, in the two recordings. Uh, so it, that suggests uh, that this, it might have gotten on there from the same way the crosstalks got on there. The way the crosstalks, those voices that you, we heard, how the simulcast happened, it turns out that at the trademark there were police officers who were keying, and they were together, and they were keying their radios, and some were on channel one and some were on channel two, and so someone on channel one was opening their microphone, clicking, because you can hear a lot of little beeps, and they were trying to signal that guy with a stuck microphone that maybe to turn off his, his microphone, his radio. Uh, they were picking up those little fragments of speech. That's how that happened. So now the suspicion is because of that slight little offset between in time between the, where the two bells were on both channels, is that it could have been uh, a bell because of those two the differences between channel one and channel two microphones may have been about 40 feet apart, and that would explain that slight little difference in time between where that bell was. So it might have been a bell, not the one in Dealey Plaza, but it might have been a bell that was audible from out over where the trademark is. I still think that, that if someone would really, really analyze that bell sound and try to do a study on it, there could be some real clues, especially with regard to why there are these offsets in time, uh, why the timeline is broken. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, Thank you. I, I'd like to just make, uh, amplify something from, uh, from your book, by the way, and, and also something for the audience to know. And that is when the HSC came up with this rather shocking discovery that there uh, appeared to be uh, shots that, that, that proved uh, a grassy knoll shot and more than four shot or more than three shots. Um, uh, they did they did say you know we ought to uh, uh, have a look at this again and they made some recommendations some specific suggestions as to how it ought to be done and they suggested that when someone else looks at this again they should get acoustics experts. So who did they end up getting? They got the Ramsey panel. The Ramsey panel consisted of no acoustics experts on the Ramsey panel. They were all physicists and friends and, uh, and colleagues or junior partners of Luis Alvarez. Uh, the other thing to add about Alvarez is that, as we know, Alvarez withheld, you know, falsified his own shooting experiments. Uh, we found that out in Paul Hoke's uh, files. Uh, may, some of you in this room probably also know that Louis Alvarez is the guy that denied that there had been a nuclear test in the, in the South Indian Ocean, the so-called Vela incident. Uh, Vela, a Vela satellite picked up a nuclear fla uh, flash in the South Indian Ocean, and it was then thought that there had been a nuclear blast on the basis of this flash that was very embarrassing for the Carter administration, and so they, they wanted to to refute the idea that Israel and South Africa had, had done a nuclear test down there. So they brought out Louis Alvarez, and Louis Alvarez, sure enough, went through a very elaborate study and, and, and said, no, well, uh, under normal circumstances, there had never been a false positive before, a flash that wasn't a nuclear test. But in this particular case, there was some unusual event, and it was not a nuclear blast. Um, then Seymour Hersh, of course, went down and, and talked to the people down there and the Israelis that were involved in it said, yeah, you know, that was a mistake on our part. We would always do those nuclear tests under cloud cover so the satellites wouldn't pick it up. But that day, damn it, the clouds parted and we didn't get the word out to, to, to hold off the nuclear test. So there had been a nuclear test. So Alvarez is, he, as Tink Thompson has called him, is some kind of a patriot. When you need, when you need something... You know, when you need something done, you call in Luis Alvarez to do that, and and you know he, he carries the the uh, uh, you know the water for you, and, and he did that I think in the uh, uh, in the acoustics as well as he did with the shooting experiments, as well as he did with the Vela incident. Alan, thank you, um, Dr. Thomas. Am I correct in, in thinking that um, you believe that the evidence shows that there were five shots, one from behind the grassy knoll fence? one the source of which is undefined and three from behind but not exactly defined where from behind yes correct the of the the bbn identified five 
gunshots. Uh, one of those, only one of those was analyzed using the sonar analysis to actually pinpoint the origin. And that was the study that the second group, Weiss and Ashkenazi, did to show that there was a gunshot from the grassy knoll. Now, the way that the BBN did their analysis, they were focusing on the echo field that was being produced. And they found their best match of their five. One of them matched to the test shot that came from the grassy knoll. That's the one that Weiss and Ashkenazi focused on with their sonar analysis and showed mm -hmm. to a much greater detail that it was a gunshot from the grassy knoll. The other four were never, the sonar analysis was never applied. So we're assuming three of those came from the book depository and the three, they did match two test shots from the book depository. And that left that fifth, that rogue shot, which was never been analyzed in spite of people trying to get, have acoustical experts uh, analyze these other shots, but so, it's never been done. So, so the only defined actual source of the acoustically defined shot is from behind the fence on the grassy knoll? That's correct. Thank you. Dr. Newman? Yes. <clears throat> I'd, uh, maybe, Don, you can uh, answer this question, uh, but while we're talking about bullets and holes and all that stuff, I happened to be with Steve Tilly and Nara one day, and we were looking at a galley proof of the Warren Report. And in one section, I don't know what the page was, the handwritten note was, move bullet hole up nine inches. Now, I was told that the handwriting uh, was Gerald Ford's, and I'm not an expert on that, but I just wondered where we stand today on that. Maybe if Cyril's not here, uh, Gary could talk to that, or maybe Don, somebody who knows a little more than I do about that. But I saw it with my eyes. I was astounded. Thank you. Right. And later, it was, it was realized that Ford had done that, that he moved it up because the the photographs actually do show the, that the gun entrance wound was in the, was in the back. Uh, and he wanted it to be in the neck to give it a better trajectory. Yeah, that, Last question? That was Gerald Ford, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well known now, and, and, and he's been exposed to that. You can Google it up, and, and it, it became, it was a minor news item for a while that Gerald Ford basically <clears throat> wanted to move the, the, the back wound up a little bit, and had done so. Dr. Thomas, this is more of a comment. And I'm a novice among all these experts. But about three years ago, we were at the Aldolfus in Dallas, and we were walking up to the dinner, which we're having tonight, and a similar thing, and an old gentleman was walking up with me. And it turns out that it was Officer McLean. Whoa. And Officer, I thought this might interest somebody in here. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting next to him and talking with him through the dinner. And his whole family was sitting around the table. And of course, me being naive and an amateur at this, I was just asking him innocent questions. And he said he hadn't spoken for 50 years or whatever it was, because so many people around him that did speak, or let's say everybody, his family made him promise not to speak. After the government, I don't know who the government is, went to the Dallas Police Department and said, what did you see? And he told the truth, along with the other officers. They said, no, you didn't see that. And he said, I won't say what he said, but an expletive. And he never spoke again about the topic. Now, I don't know if he's still living or not, but 50 years later, he started talking. And I sat next to him, and he talked the whole night. It was incredible. It made me really sad, because I remember as a young, I was like 11, seeing him next to Mrs. Kennedy's next to the car and he said he's the one that told Mrs. Kennedy Mrs. Kennedy you have to let your husband go now I have to I mean you know that's a moment you never forget right thank you um, Mr. Gordon we've really got to move forward is it possible could we address this with with doctor in in private I just want to make a statement okay for the record. Um, I was the one who synchronized the acoustics tape with the Zapruder film for the House Assassinations Committee. And um, it was a unanimous feeling of all of us who were working on it that the fatal shot came from the front. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Blakey didn't want that. He wanted the uh, fatal shot to be from behind and uh, changed what we had done. But we were unanimous that the shot had come from the front. That's all.